we're recording this at a pretty interesting time. You know, the, the, the market is, in my opinion, it's shifting and it's correcting. Um, I, I think a lot of opportunity uh, is yet to come. Um, and I think, I mean, I love real estate because of what it's done for me personally and how many people I've met like yourself, you know, through masterminds and all that. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Having access to private money always doubles or triples or even quadruples your real estate investing business. And I'm not talking about using institutional money or hard money to fund your deals. I'm talking about having access to funding from individuals, from human beings just like you and me to fund your real estate deals. Well, my guest in this episode of Raising Private Money pulls the curtain back as to how he went from being a wholesaler to staying in his deals with private money. And guess what? Using private money did not double or triple or quadruple his business. Private money 5X'd his business in less than a year. My guest on this show is Will Dennis from Hollywood, Florida, and you're going to learn a lot about how he uses private money to fund his deals in this episode. So if you don't ever want to miss out on a deal because you don't have the money or the funding, you're going to love every second of this show. Let's dive in right now. Welcome to Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. I'm Jay Connor, your host of the show, also known as the Private Money Authority. And today I am so excited on this show to have a good friend of mine, fellow mastermind member, Will Dennis is his name, and he's got a huge background in finance. Uh, that's been a huge asset, actually, in his real estate investing career. And it's earned him the nickname, and I love his nickname, Willie Numbers. I got to ask him when he gets on here. I don't know where he got that nickname. But anyway, students of Will, they actually learn how to analyze deals to maximize their potential gains. In addition to that, Will has raised private money. So we're going to dig into his brain uh, as well about his experience in private money. And with that, let's welcome to the show, my good friend, Will Dennis. Will, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jay. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, tell everybody, where are you located and where are you doing investing these days? Yeah, so we're based out of South Florida, uh, Fort Lauderdale primarily. Um, and we're doing the Tri-County area, which is Palm Beach, Miami-Dade, and Broward. And then we also do Pinellas, Hillsboro, which is the Tampa area, and some other parts of Central Florida. All right. Well, I tell you what, uh, for the sake of the podcast, uh, which will be released um, in just a few weeks, let me go ahead and start out the podcast right now with this question. Go ahead. Will, tell me, what did your real estate investing career look like prior to using private money? And then what did it look like after you started using private money? Well, it's pretty simple when, when you start off and, you know, I started off in wholesaling, uh, as many of us do, uh, you know, as you grow up and as you move on, you start to take down deals yourself, right. And rehab them and fix and flip them more traditionally. And you start to use hard money with some money that you've saved up. Right. So what happened was I, I got to the point where we had done so many deals and built up a track record where our attorney actually reached out to us first, who was also our title attorney. And he said, hey, if you guys ever, you know, he saw a loan come in one time and he said, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd love to fund this uh, if you guys ever you know, needed it. And I hadn't really thought about it. So, you know, that kind of kicked it off for me, uh, my background being in finance. And then I started to approach other people that started to see I was having success in real estate. Some of them approached me. Sometimes I approached them and it really got easy because I was able to leverage those relationships and take on 100 percent financing 
most cases, the rehab costs as well on that project. So I didn't have to have my capital tied up to be able to, you know, put down 20% or 10% with a hard money lender, right? Uh, so it allowed us to do a lot more deal flow and especially the quick ones, like the wholesales and stuff. So yeah, it, it definitely, it probably three, four X my business uh, from, from the numbers perspective. Yes. I'm the same way. I've, I've got a long list of reasons why I absolutely love private money. I tell you, I remember it like it was yesterday, what my business was like before private money. And that was, I was controlled by the banks. Uh, I was borrowing money from my local bank. And then all of a sudden in January, 2009, I learned on a phone call that I didn't have any more funding at my bank. So I had to find a better and quicker way that being private money. And since that time, I've not missed out on a deal for not having the funding. Now you said you started out in wholesaling, then you started staying in some deals, taking down some deals. So you mentioned private money and you also mentioned hard money. Now, yep. what is your difference? You know, there's, I was on a, I was at an expo a couple of weeks ago on stage and it's mm -hmm. funny. I was on, I was on stage with, um, some hard money lenders. Uh, I don't borrow hard money. I borrow from individuals, private money and different people, even in the industry have their own definitions of what hard money is and what private money is. What's your definition of a hard money lender and what's your definition of a private money lender? I boil it down to speed and time. Uh, for me, a, money, a, a private money lender is someone that I can close tomorrow if I needed to be. And I and will fund me 100%. It's not worried about appraisals, not worried about any issues, doesn't really care about title issues. It's more relationship driven. If, if I'm telling him or her, hey, this is a deal I have, I need 300 grand tomorrow because it's going to auction, the money will be there, no question. On the hard money side, it's more of a process. Uh, most of the time, hard money lenders, there's no right or wrong here, but most of the time they raise it from Peter to pay Paul, um, you know, that kind of structure. So there's a little bit more red tape. They're going to want an appraisal. They might want a BPO, et cetera. So it definitely slows down what you can do. And also hard money typically is going to require, you know, a 15 to 20% down payment. If you have a good relationship, maybe a 10% down payment, right? Um, they're also typically the first people to go in a down economy, like what we're seeing right now. And they tighten up, um, my private lenders have not. So it, it would be access to capital. That, that would be my biggest differentiator. Well, Will, your definition of hard money and private money is the same definition as mine. Um, and the reasons that you started listing as to why you like private money, uh, say versus borrowing institutional money. So yes, my definition is the same. A private money lender is an individual. It's a human being just like you and me that we do business with. And there's no middle person involved. And like you said, in my experience, most hard money lenders, and by the way, I got a lot of friends that are hard money lenders. They, they raise money from private lenders, right? They raise money. Yeah. You said raise it from Peter who's the private lender to pay Paul, who is the hard money lenders customer, right? The, bar, the borrower. And Correct. so hard money lenders, a broker, middle person. And so in this world of private money, we're just circumventing the, the brokerage and we're just going directly to the uh, individuals that are funding the deals. Well, I, I call these type of deals one-offs. And the reason I call them one-offs is, I'm not having my private lenders invest in a fund, not even my own fund. It's like they're borrowing money and they're loaning that money on a particular property. And then their loan, their principal loan amount, that promissory note is being collateralized by that property. I want to go back to what you were saying a moment ago. You, you started listing some reasons why you like private money quicker, I mean quicker, why you like it better. <laughs> One of your yeah. first reasons was quicker. Why you yeah. like it better than you do hard money. The first thing you said is you can close a loan tomorrow uh, yeah. when you're using private money. So I want to hang out that on that again. Tell us again why, a pri why you can close with a private lender in 24 hours, but with a hard money broker, it might take best case, you know, two or three weeks. Yeah. So I've found in my experience is short answer, the private money guy or girl already has the money. 
uh, it's already in their account. So whether it's in a brokerage account or an IRA or a Sidra or their own cash or a business account or a line of credit that they can tap into, it's in usually one of those buckets uh, and they're ready to go. So they don't have to think about it. It's definitely relationship based. So with your track record, it's going to reflect the fact that I need to close tomorrow. So that that's really the main reason they do have the capital. They don't have to go borrow it. Exactly. And another reason you mentioned was appraisals. Very seldom do I even get appraisals um, done on the deals that I'm uh, buying when I'm using private money. <clears throat> I use my realtor's um, you know, comparative market analysis. So I actually know what the after repaired value is of the property, but I don't use appraisals either. How do you verify the value of a property before you make an offer? You're saying when I'm making an offer with a seller or, or when I'm pitching. No, I'm sorry. With a, with a seller, we were just talking about verifying and proving yeah. value, but I sort of digressed off a of product. Sure. The money or you're buying it creatively or your, your intention is to wholesale it. How do you get your, uh, how do you come up with the after repaired value? I use my realtor and he gives me all the info in less than 24 business hours. Yeah. So I have, this is the way that I've structured it. I have a team. Um, believe it or not, I have, I think we have like 13 VAs now in our team. So there's two VAs, um, sometimes three that have been taught, uh, how to run comps by myself or by my business partner. So I have a lot of videos and I don't know how much detail you want me to go into, but I have a lot of videos that I've recorded screen share of me actually running comps verbatim, whether it's on multifamily or single family. And that is copied by our VAs and they use the MLS or prop stream if it's outside of our, of our primary markets. But I would say 90% of the time they're using the MLS to do it. Those are the best comps. Um, with that being said, I'll just chime in and say, you know, it's October 4th. So the economy is kind of scaling here and it's changing. Um, we used to use with confidence six months in arrears for comps. We do not use that anymore. I'm only taking things about 45 to 60 days uh, in arrears. So I'm tightening up those, those that comp uh, time frame. Yes, that makes sense. Um, another reason that you said you just really love private money is not only is it quick, not only do you not have to get an appraisal, um, but in addition to that, uh, you mentioned that you're able to get all the funding. Um, it Correct. sounds like you do the same thing as I, when you're using private money, you don't even have to come up with any money of your own to take to the closing table. In fact, well, if you're like me, you always pick up a big check when you buy a property with private money. Is that the same yeah. for you? Yeah. So I, I, you know, check wire, same thing, but yes, we, we get cash to close for sure. Uh, if I, I, I just closed on one, um, a little bit less than a month ago in Hollywood, the acquisition price was 570. We figured we were going to put 550 or excuse me, 50 into it. So we, we got 620 um, at closing. That was, the, that was the whole loan amount. So it's, it's easy. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, my favorite phrase on my real estate attorney's checks. Now they don't wire out due to the fraud. I mean, you actually have to get a check from them. Sure. And uh, so Every time when I buy a property, there's a phrase on the check stub of the um, of the check the uh, the funding check that we get, and it's called excess cash to close. Correct. And I tell you what, Will, if you're like me, you like yourself some excess cash when you're buying. And you know, people say to me, they say, Jay, how in the world can can you be getting a big check when you buy a property? It's like, how does that work? And well, the answer is simple. You get a big check because you always borrow more than you need to buy the property. And they'll go, well, how can you do that? Well, the only way this works is if you're buying these properties at a substantial discount. I'm interested in knowing what your criteria is, Will. My rule of thumb is I don't want to borrow more than 75% when a rehab is involved. I don't want to borrow more than 75% of the after repaired value. I didn't say 75% of the purchase price, 75% of the after repair. For example, uh, and I'm leading up to asking you what your rule of thumb is here in a second. 
So for example, let's say that I've got a house here in Eastern North Carolina with an after repaired value of $200,000. Well, I know in California, you can't even buy an outhouse for $200,000. <laughs> but yeah. here in Eastern North Carolina, you, you still can. So let's say I got an after repaired value of 200000 Well, I buy houses that need rehab all the time at 50 cents, 50% of the after repaired value. So I might buy that house for $100,000. $100, and maybe it needs 30000 or 35000 in rehab. Well, I can borrow... If I'm borrowing 75% of the after repaired value, I can borrow $150,000 uh, in this example when the after repaired value is $200,000. Well, I'm going to bring home a $50,000 check, um, less closing costs, and I may use thirty or 35000 of that for rehab, but I can use the rest of it any way I want to. Carrying costs, maybe I'm paying my private lender's payments, maybe I'm not. What is your rule of thumb as to the maximum to borrow when using private money? I'm usually right around there. I'm in South Florida, so property values are a little bit higher than yours. Um, when I get into Northern Florida, it, it, it's typically more like that scenario, the 200,000. Um, 200,000 in South Florida really doesn't get you much, but we do go off market 95% of the time. So it, it's not uncommon for me to pick something up that the ARV is... 400 and I'm picking it up for 200, um, believe it or not. Uh, th those are bigger spreads that I'm definitely applying hard money on um, unless I get offered some ridiculous assignment fee, which is fine. But yeah, it's, it's probably 75 to 80%. I, I, I don't feel more, I don't feel comfortable, especially now in this sliding economy. Uh, I'm, I'm being even more conservative. I, I, you know, we can get into that, but I've, I've really gone back and made sure anything we're closing on. So our rule of thumb used to be if we're going to close on it, we'd like a hundred K gross spread when we were closing on it to, to fix and flip it. Now my new rule of thumb is I want 150 grand of gross spread. Um, I'm just building in, you know, an extra 50% cushion uh, just in case, <laughs> you know, you never know. So some parts well, of Florida have already kind of taken a 20 to 25% hit right now. So, you know, yeah, well, that's, that's a wise way to look at it. You said something a moment ago that I can for sure relate to. And you said, you know, when the economy starts to tighten up, then hard money does, but not private money. So I want to I want to ask your experience and I'll share mine first. When COVID came along, I, I call COVID coming along in March 2020 is sort of my my mark on the calendar. And uh, as I say, I've got a lot of friends that are you know, hard money lenders. Uh, I got a lot of friends that borrow hard money that you know, don't do private money the way that I do. And I tell you uh, what I heard is like shortly after COVID started, hard money lenders, I mean, not only did they tighten up, they shut down. Like mm -hmm. they weren't loaning any money because everybody yeah. was scared to death. And you know what's interesting, uh, Will? I had more private money chase me in 2020, more individuals wanting to loan me money in 2020 and 2021 than I had ever had before. Now, I think part of the reason for that is prior to COVID, there was $18 trillion in cash sitting on the sidelines that could be used for private investment or private lending or whatever. But now on this side of COVID, there's $31 trillion that's just in the marketplace in cash. Um, I think part of that is because there's, regardless of anyone's political affiliation, uh, there's been more money printed in the basement of the White House since the current administration took office. But I mean, that's just the fact. There's so much cash on the street. So, uh, so what year did you start uh, investing in real estate, Will? I started in 2017. 2017. So you had yeah. been in it for three years when COVID came along in 2020. Had you started using private money by 2020? Yeah, yeah. So I, I actually had, I, I stumbled, I don't know if we can curse on the show, but I stumbled ass backwards into, uh, you know, uh, private money. Um, I, I, I figured it out by accident very early on. It was actually late 2017. I figured it out by structuring owner finance with a private note. Some people would call that syndication. I didn't know what the hell it was called at the time, but 
I figured out how to buy 16 units using private money and owner finance. So that's how I figured it out, you know, again, by mistake. And then I said to myself, well, damn, this is pretty cool. And, then, you know, it kind of, as it grew and, you know, more deals and stuff like that. And it really just opened my eyes because I was like, man, if I could do this on 16 doors, which by the way, was 10 times easier than doing it on one single family. So let's just make that a point on the show. Um, bigger is better and it's easier. That's just my opinion. And my experience. I love it. I love it. So, so you started using private money and, and you started using it by accident. You backed into it. I did too. I mean, mine was out of necessity. I lost my line of credit at the bank and I had to find a, a better and quicker way. Did you experience the same thing uh, when COVID came along? Did you have more private money chasing you as well? Yeah. Yeah. I had more people um, contact me and, and reach out to me. Uh, I firmly believe that, yes, there was a lot of cash sitting on the sideline, but also they had nowhere else to put it in. And, and my common conversation with people is that with real estate, it's such an easy transition uh, and sell, if you will, or to frame the conversation because you're securitized by a real asset first position. So it's a no brainer, you know, worst case scenario, you know, you could take it back uh, and you can cash flow it, God forbid. Right. But, you know, and, and, and you have that that margin built into it. So, I mean, yeah, I, I definitely noticed there was a lot more people willing to loan, uh, not on the hard money side. Those guys no, no. ran for the hills. <laughs> well, for, for and the so you're making a big point here. You're making a big point here, particularly coming into a market as we are now where things are tightening up, you know, well, when you're, when you're funding your deals with private money, you don't have to worry about it tightening up. People are still wanting to make a high rate of return safely and securely on either investment capital or their self-directed IRA funds. I've got 44 private lenders right now, Will, and over half of them are using their retirement funds in order to, you know, fund our deals. You know, you said something a few minutes ago as well, and that is you talked about how um, private money 3X and 4X your business, whereas you were able to do so many more deals by just having the cash and the funding available. Did I hear that right? Yes, sir. Yeah. And I, and I also, um, speaking on the, the COVID transition, I saw at the time there was so many people that had exited the space, the business guys that I was, you know, my quote unquote competitors at the time. So we throttled down when it was around June, July of 2020. Um, there was like a two, three month span there where nobody knew where the heck the world was going and all that. Um, we decided to double and triple down on marketing. But I also, when I started seeing the market pick up, particularly in South Florida, so many people were, were flowing in from other states. Um, it helped our business tremendously. So I started taking on a lot more private money at the time uh, because I knew, hey, if I could make a 30K assignment fee, I could probably rip a 60, 70K exit especially using hundred percent financing with, with private money. So that, that was my you know, strategy during COVID. So it, it allowed us to do a lot more deal and doing, you know, our operation does about 120 deals a year. So we have a lot to choose from, you know, that's awesome. Will. that's awesome. Will, I want to go ahead and give a free gift uh, to my listener here on the show. And then I want to dive deep with you into your other expertise that you have in addition to private money. So first of all, if you are wanting private money and you want to get deals funded and put yourself in the driver's seat, I'm so excited about this brand new private money guide that I just finished writing. It's called seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate business and help you build incredible wealth. This will put you on the fast track to private money. It's absolutely free. You can download it at J Connor. I'm an ER, not an OR, by the way. You can download it at J Connor, J A Y C O N N E R dot com forward slash money guide. That's J Connor, J A Y C O N N E R dot com forward slash money guide. This guide will get you on the fast track to private money. Well, in addition to private money, you have other expertises, uh, one of which is how you analyze deals. Uh, you work with, you have students that you teach them how to analyze the deals. So what is it about how you analyze deals that is, say, different and maybe better 
than the way other people do it. And uh, what is it that makes you, you know, stand out and you're set apart from uh, how you analyze deals? Yeah, so it's a combination of things. Uh, again, I always try to get my team the best tools for the job. Um, you know, the MLS, in my opinion, is probably the most accurate and, and the most effective way to, to, to run comps. But I understand that not everybody's going to have access. I do like prop stream over the years. Uh, you know, there's a lot of difference of opinions. I also taught my VAs how to run comps doing value add. So in South Florida, what I mean by that is if you're analyzing a 3-1, and I've given them parameters that I've learned over the years, but if you're analyzing a three-bed, one-bath, right, for example, and it has 1,200 square feet, well, in my eyes as an investor, I know that that's a three-bed, two-bath. I know I can add a bathroom there, no problem, and I can increase value by 40, 50, 60 grand, right? So that's going to take a huge swing on how I can offer and how competitive I can be, right? So that's one of the main points of how I teach my VAs how to do it and how we've taught them over the years and how I've made a lot of money. And, and that's what I mean by maximizing the value on the deal. Because if you're running that comp, for example, and your ARV as a 3.1 is 250, but as a 3.2, it's it's 310, um, that's a significantly different offer. Um, and, and that becomes very true when I walk the property. So little things like that, if, if, if I see from an aerial view, right, or on the property appraiser that you know, there, there's a, a, an addition in the back or some sort of utility closet. I check the sketches on the county level. Um, you know, these are just little tricks and tips that, that I use to know how I can maximize that house and make sure that I'm, I'm squeezing every dollar out of it. Well, that's, <clears throat> that's a, a brilliant way to go about it. In other words, you're not calculating value necessarily on just how that house is currently configured but how much more profit could be, how much is it going to cost and how much more profit, how much more valuable could it be once it's rehabbed at a bath or whatever? I've got some friends um, that one thing they do as far as value add, as far as value add goes, one thing they almost always do. And I'm wondering if you have mm -hmm. one thing they almost always do is they will convert a garage into a heated and uh, cooled square footage um, for, depending on how big the garage, if it's one car, it might be a bedroom. If it's a two car, it might be another living area. And I'm really curious as to your, and of course that gives much more value to the house yeah. because it's heated, heated and cooled. But you know, some people don't want a house unless it's got a garage. So your answer may be, well, it depends, but what is your answer to that on converting garages to heated and cooled square footage? Well, it does depend. <laughs> I, hate to, I hate to burst your bubble on that one, but yeah, it does depend. Uh, I'm looking first at the area and I'm also looking at comps. So in that scenario, I'm going to look at, okay, what has sold near this subject property? And are they selling? Do I see a lot of conversions in the carport? Carports are really popular in Florida. Uh, so Am I seeing a lot of carport conversions? Just from the Google Street View, I could tell, hey, this was a carport. Now it's a bedroom. It's got a window in it now. You, you can, it's pretty easy to tell. So if I'm seeing that, then I'm going to say, okay, I'm probably going to convert in this area. Assuming, you know, then you have to get into, it is a risk. If you get caught by the city, you're not doing it with permits, right? It's an illegal enclosure, whatever. It's, it's not, it's rare. It doesn't always happen, but that's an issue. But if it's a garage and I'm seeing like in this property that I just told you about in Hollywood, it has a two car garage. The highest and best use of that property is to keep it with a two car garage because at an 800,000 plus dollar price point exit, that seller wants a two car garage. They don't care for an extra bedroom at, at, at that scenario. Plus the house was already a four two. So I, I, like I said, right, it depends. And I'm, I'm really looking at that. If I'm going at a lower tier price point in a maybe less desirable area, maybe 350, 400, I'm probably going to, I want that type of buyer wants all the square footage they can get. So if I can do it, I don't have a reoccupancy or anything like that on the municipal level, I, I'm going to pull the trigger on it. So it really comes down to knowing your market. Correct. Uh, and, and, and you make a very, very important point about the price point. I can see how a 
$800,000 home, um, you know, those people are going to want a two car garage. But um, if I heard you right, the lower price points, they may be more interested in more heated and cooled square footage, or if it's only Absolutely. a three bedroom, you know, a four bedroom or, or something like that. So um, point well it's taken also, there. Uh, uh, sorry, but it also, whether it's, if, it, if I'm talking to a buy and holder or if I'm talking to a guy who's going to keep this as a rental, I can promise you he's going to want more square footage as opposed to a carport. Carport doesn't really do much for his rent, but if he has a three, two now or a four, two, that's going to jack up his rent. If he's going section eight, it's going to increase his voucher. So that that's definitely how I would read that. Got you. Uh, Will, your website is www.willynumbers.com, W-I-L-L-Y, numbers, N-U-M-B-E-R-S.com. What can someone learn by going to your website, willynumbers.com? Yeah, so I'm actually in the process right now of launching a course on, and, and it launches next week, but launching a course, how to teach someone who knows absolutely nothing about real estate, part-time or full-time, how to get their first deal, and then how to continuously repeat that month after month and scale. Uh, it'll be the first one to be in English and Spanish, uh, so that's pretty cool. They can also learn how to work with me, um, how to join venture, because I do do JVs across the nation, um, and then eventually we'll, we'll launch a, a coaching program just to, to work directly with me. All right. Well, that's fantastic. So that is Willie Numbers, www.willy, W-I-L-L-Y, numbers, N-U-M-B-E-R-S, dot com. Willie, what would you say is your superpower? What are you just like really, really good at that sort of sets you apart? Honestly, being relentless. <laughs> it's it's probably not the sexiest answer, but being relentless is, is I would consider it my superpower. Um, staying consistent, especially through, through a tough market and starting out in this business or any business where you, you have to have so much sweat equity to get off the ground, um, kind of like a plane taking off. It uses most of its fuel on the takeoff, not in flight. Um, but once you get in flight, it's, it's pretty easy, right? So I, I would say relentlessness is definitely my superpower. How do you stay relentless? <laughs> I guess we all do it in different ways. But and, and, I, and I, I, yeah. You I, just I refuse to give up. Yeah. I anchor. I mean, I'm stubborn as hell, but I, I anchor it in my why. You know, why am I doing this? And, and going back to that kind of side of it. Uh, and, you know, that could be spiritual. That could be family. That, that You know, my why for a long time is, you know, my mom and my mother. Uh, single mom, single grandmother, and it was making enough money to be able to make sure that, you know, nothing would happen to them, you know, but if it, if it's money, there's nothing wrong with it. I, I've certainly had my why be, I just want to make a lot of money. It's great, but it's really from a guy who's experienced it, it's really only going to get you that far. Um, and it's at some point it's, it's not gonna, it's not going to keep driving you. That's for sure. Awesome. Final words, yeah. final thoughts, uh, Will. We're recording this at a pretty interesting time. You know, the, the, the market is, in my opinion, it's shifting and it's correcting. Um, I, I think a lot of opportunity uh, is yet to come. Um, and I think, I mean, I love real estate because of what it's done for me personally and how many people I've met like yourself, you know, through masterminds and all that. I would say probably masterminding and being around, around the right people um, has certainly accelerated uh my learning curve you know I, I i'm probably where i'm at right now and it probably should have taken me 10 to 12 years as opposed to five and a half right so that that would be my my best piece of you know some final words here awesome will thank you so much for joining me on the show thank you i appreciate it and thank you my listener for joining us here on the show you are the reason that we are here and i need your help I really need your help. I appreciate likes, shares, subscribing. Uh, if you happen to be uh, watching on YouTube, click that bell so you don't miss out on any more notifications. And one more thing I need your help with, and that is please share this podcast with someone that you believe that it could inspire and also help them in their real estate investing business. 
I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best. Here's to taking your real estate investing business to the next level. And we'll see you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconnor.com slash money guide. That's j-c-o-n-n-e-r.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.